What's up guys, welcome to Daily Dose of Reddit, this is your host, Zach, and today's subreddit is r slash pro revenge. This story's called, That's Not Your Car Lady. So this happened around 2008. My buddy Brock had gotten out of the military after 10 years. He'd started in the Marines, but transitioned into the Army for the last four years before buying a house in Texas. <laughs> When he got out, he did a variety of jobs before landing a gig with a repo service. He worked there for a year and had a lot of wild stories, but this one sticks out the most as he helped a fellow soldier get revenge on an evil ex. Brock was at the office speaking with his manager, whom I'll refer to as Karen. Now, this particular Karen had a lot of Karen-like qualities, but was a force for good, if you can believe that. Hey, good, you can get rid of the solely negative stigma that comes with Karen. Maybe just annoyingly assertive. While they were talking, they see a young man enter the office. They immediately noticed he had two black eyes and an arm was in a sling. The young man, whose name I unfortunately never learned, but I'll call Ben, asked how hard it would be for them to help repossess his car. Karen called her daughter in, Karen Jr., and had her poor Ben a cup of coffee. Karen then asked Ben to tell her a story. Ben began with telling her that he had just returned from a deployment. He had been dating a local girl that lived outside of the famous Fort Hood. Not a good idea, by the way. Before the deployment. Thanks to a previous deployment, he had managed to get himself a used black Dodge Charger, which was his baby. He further explained that shortly after buying the car, he had met the local girl, who, for the sake of the story, I'll call Morgan. Morgan was always asking to drive his car, but he would always decline. When he was getting ready for his deployment, Morgan repeatedly asked asked if she could borrow the car, but he kept saying no. After much needling, he relented, but on the condition that she take care of his apartment until he comes back from rest and relaxation leave. She agreed. Ben left for his deployment while Morgan took care of his place. When Ben came back for leave, he found his apartment immaculate. He pulled his car from storage, drove to Morgan's. He spent a few days with her before handing her the keys and heading to his home state to visit family before returning to his deployment. He returned to again from his deployment and found nothing but trouble. When he walked into his apartment, he found a layer of dust on just about every surface. It was almost like no one had been there in months. When he checked his bedroom, he'd found his room had been torn apart. All of his drawers had been searched and upturned. He tried to call Morgan, but never received an answer. He located his safe, which was hidden, and found it hadn't been touched. He then grabbed his spare key from the safe, called a buddy of his, and they went to Morgan. As they pulled up to Morgan's, he saw a car there that he initially didn't recognize. But as they got closer, he realized it was his baby. Morgan had the car painted a hot pink and put 24-inch spinners on it. He tried the key just to make sure, and the lights flickered as it unlocked. While his buddy laughed, Ben went to the front door and Morgan answered. He asked what happened to his car, and she responded, It's my car now. Ben walked away and hopped in his hot pink mess. As he started it, four large dew came out of Morgan's house, one with a baseball bat, and yanked Ben out of his car. They proceeded to beat the crap out of him in the driveway before his friend intervened, pulling his conceal and carry pistol on the group. He then took Ben to the hospital. I'm honestly not sure if the cops were called on this. I'd assume yes, but even then, Ben said his friend drove by Morgan's house a handful of times while he was in the hospital at random times, and the car was never there. Karen stared at Ben for a bit before asking for the paperwork. Ben handed it over, and Karen had a smile form on her face. She then asked Ben for Morgan's phone number. Ben gave it, but wasn't aware of what was about to happen. Karen handed the phone to Karen Jr., who then dialed the number. Karen Jr. then began speaking to Morgan, telling her that they'd met at one of the local clubs and wanted to know if she was down to party that night. Apparently, Morgan agreed, and the plan was set. Brock parked his tow truck at the club and waited. Sure enough, Morgan showed up with the pink monster, parked it, and went inside with some girlfriends. Brock gave them five minutes before he stealthily drove up to the car and hooked it up. As he was pulling it out with the pink monster, Morgan walked out of the club. She saw her car in the tow truck and began trying to flag Brock down, but he was already out of there. The next day, it was business as usual at the office when Morgan called. She was furious that her car was stolen by them and wanted it back. Karen 
used her best customer service voice, told her if she had the registration, she could come pick it up. Morgan began screaming louder that she was going to call the cops, at which point Karen sarcastically told her, please do, then hung up on her. As this phone call was going on, Brock happened to look out the window and saw Morgan standing next to a car in a vacant lot, throwing what appeared to be a temper tantrum. After Karen hung up, Brock wanted to get her in the car on the passenger side. Karen looked out the window and had Brock verify it was her. She then began to smirk. Karen then proceeded to call the owner of the property Morgan and her friend were occupying. She told the owner about her car and asked if he wanted it towed. The owner okayed it. Brock then drove his truck over to the ladies in the car and introduced himself. They tried to explain that they were waiting for Morgan's boyfriend, but Brock insisted they weren't allowed to park there. They argued and called him every name in the book. Brock then hooked up their car and lifted it partially off the ground, forcing the two to exit the vehicle. They tore into him until he showed them the tow order. While this back and forth was going on, Ben arrived at the office, and Morgan saw him walk in. She ran to the office door, and Brock proceeded to lower the vehicle. When Brock went back to the office, all hell had broken loose. Morgan apparently tried to snag the keys back from Ben, but he pocketed them. She began to hit him in his hurt arm and warned Ben that she'd call her friends to finish the job if she didn't get her keys back. Karen Jr. had already called the cops at this point and Brock got in between Ben and Morgan, even telling Morgan to try hitting him to find out what would happen. Morgan then tried to play the pity card and said she only wanted the keys to get her laptop out for school. Karen asked Ben to hand the keys over to Brock so she could grab the laptop. Brock retrieved the laptop from the car and as he was handing it over, she rushed to aggressively grab it but knocked it from Brock's hands. Completely furious at this point, Morgan accused Brock of dropping the computer on purpose and threatened to sue. The cops then arrived and then Morgan began her sob story again, telling the police that they stole her car. The police questioned Karen and Karen gave her a casual smirk while asking if they wanted to see the security photos. The police watched and listened as Morgan punched Ben several times and heard threats she made about sending her friends after him. The police then turned to Morgan, who had turned ghost white at this point. She tried to back her way to the door, but the police stopped her. They proceeded to ask about the car, Ben's injuries, and who she planned on sending after him. She initially denied everything, but they already had evidence on her beating him up. She was arrested, and Ben got his car back. After the cops left, Ben admitted he didn't want to be seen in a car that looked like it was advertising Pepto-Bismol and planned on trading it for a GTO. We later heard through the grapevine that the four guys who beat up Ben were arrested. Morgan had ratted them out. Brock had a few more stories, but none of them were nearly as good as this one. Edit. Damn, barely an hour and it's blown up a bit. Thanks, guys. Also, edit too. Wow, thanks for all the support, guys. I love that so many have enjoyed this story, so I've had a few people try to refute this story, and I assure you this story is true. I have no reason to lie to anyone about this. Also, some people are asking how this is considered pro-revenge. While Ben didn't personally get the revenge, Karen was the instrument of Morgan's destruction. She set Morgan up to lose the car after Ben and his friends couldn't locate it on their own. Morgan's fate was more or less her own doing. She believed that she could strong arm an injured man with multiple witnesses while making threats. Also, while gang activity was fairly high in the Colleen, Texas area, I'm not 100% on if they were connected to any gangs. I just want to throw that last part out there. Wow, that sounds like a lovely thing to come back to uh, after you were not in the country for months on end. That's crazy. Why did she think that she could get away with that? This story's called Depth From The Grave. A story of money. Depth from the grave, okay. Uh, my grandma told me this story recently about how her brother got his ass kicked from the grave. Sorry for the bad English, I do not write it very well and I have dyslexia, so sorry if I butcher the text. So this is a scenario. My grandma comes from a family of five. Four girls, one boy. My great-grandfather, Hank, was ecstatic with the boy. We'll call him Jack. 
One more important thing is that my great-grandfather ran a very successful company that made high-end clothing and bathrooms, silk towels and bathrobes. He made a fortune with his company and made sure everyone who worked for the company got his fair share. Sounds like socialism to me. He also looked after the family. All his children got an education. All his children got the chance to get their driver's license. It was in the 1960s, so it was a big deal back then. They were the first in my hometown with a car, radio, and TV. My great-grandfather treated everyone equal. That changed when his first and only son was born. He already had four girls and now finally had a son. The roadmap was laid out for him. He would be the heir to his company. So began the upbringing of Jack. He was, let's say, a kid with a mouth. This wasn't bad per se. The thing was that his father allowed it. Jack got kicked from his first school. Jack got caught shoplifting. Jack got kicked from his second school. Jack got caught joyriding and so on and so on. Hank did not sit Jack down and tell him the severity of his actions, but he would shrug it off and tell his wife, great-grandmother, Anna, that they were just childhood quirks. Anna tried to make something out of Jack, but it was a lost cause. Jack turned 18 and Hank decided that it was time to introduce him to the company. The company did better than ever and the whole family was involved. Jack began at the bottom of the ladder and had to work his way up. This is where Jack began to shine. With shine, my grandmother meant that her brother was not a bright light at school, but he was a hard worker and had a nose for business. Not so much for people. Jack was being an ass as per usual and got married to his first Karen. His first wife was... A Karen. She wanted to start her own company, and her father-in-law, Hank, wanted to retire. She pushed Jack to take over quickly and push the rest of the family out. Jack listened to her and talked to his father how he was ready and how his sisters and their husbands were tearing the company apart if they would stay in their leadership roles. The thing was that only one daughter and son-in-law were involved in the company at this point, 1980. My grandmother oversaw the seamstresses and the quality department, and my grandfather oversaw the finance and the suppliers. Karen wanted full control and started a little fire in the family. She spread a rumor that grandfather stole from the company. I do not know what transpired, but in the end, my great-grandfather bought out all the family and Jack bought out great-grandfather. The company was Jack and Karen's company now and things went tits up pretty quickly. Seamstresses quit, bills were not paid, and Jack had to take a loan from great-grandfather. The family company was barely screwed scraping by, and Karen left Jack because he could not provide for her. It became apparent that Jack could not make it work and was looking for a way out. After a while, great-grandfather had seen enough and bought back the remnants of his company and sold it to a bigger company that wanted to expand. This made the wealth he amassed even bigger. He did set up different banking accounts for his children and said that if someone was in need, that they could take money from that account. He told Jack that his cut was smaller as he was the reason he sold the company and that he was let down by the carelessness his son had run his company into the ground. Jack was angry and told his father that he could make it work if he had more time. It remained a sour point between the two of them. Things went well for a while, but Jack married a second time with a woman named Helen. Helen, like Karen, wanted her own business. Jack agreed and took money from the account in order to start Helen's company. The business was a little barber shop and ran pretty well. They were spending their money on luxury and did not save any money. After a while, my grandmother got a call from her little brother Jack if he could store some goods in her garage. My grandfather did not trust Jack and told him no, and grandmother did not agree, but they agreed to it. A few weeks later, Jack got caught for possession of stolen goods and drug smuggling. It was not a surprise, but nonetheless, a letdown for my great-grandfather Hank. This time, he would not help Jack and told him that he would no longer stand behind him. After a few years, Jack got out and was again a divorced man. He married again and divorced another three times, and each time he gave these women a business and lavish lives, new cars, big houses, expensive vacations. He drained his money and robbed his emergency bank account dry. He loaned a lot of money from great-grandfather and so on. In 2013, great-grandfather fell ill. It was clear that he was not going to make it and took his final days in stride. At this time, Jack Jack became very buddy-buddy and started to help great-grandfather sell some 
stuff. At some point, my grandmother sat down with her father and asked him where the money went for the sold stuff and great-grandfather told her not to worry about it. He took care of it in his will. After his 95th birthday, he passed away, quiet and in peace. After his funeral, they all went to listen to the will of their father. All except Jack, who had given power of attorney to my grandmother to sign the will in his place. All the children get their fair share, but at the end, the notary public tells them to sign the papers and the inheritance is completely theirs. At some point, my grandmother called my dad. She has inherited some collateral papers, all sorts of papers that stated that someone owed my great-grandfather money. My father said that she has to call a lawyer's office to get the money from these papers. A few days after this call to the lawyer's office, my grandmother gets a call from her brother. Why was she taking his money from the inheritance? My grandmother tells him that she has inherited some collateral papers and that she wants to get the money from them. Jack was furious and told her that that was illegal. Jack was wrong. Great-grandfather had documented every penny his son had loaned from him and constructed his will in such a way that the rest of his children could get that part of their money from their money drain of a brother. Also, great-grandfather found out Jack stole from him. You see, Jack was putting the money he made from the sold stuff in his own banking account instead of giving it to his father. After this ordeal, Jack has not contacted my grandmother or his sisters. He has since then paid everything back and has never seen a penny from his inheritance. Great-grandfather has confided in a letter why he did this. He was done with his son. All the lying, the careless things he had done to his company, all the money he had blown and not taken any responsibility. He gave his final lesson to his son from the grave. Man, it's sad how much that kid was freaking troubled. Like, Jesus, Feliz is like, uh, it sucks because like maybe him not being, obviously him not being disciplined growing up really set him up to be that kind of person. But then again, there are different ways to learn that stuff. But it's just unfortunate. But he did get what was coming to him. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode.